Well, guys, you've seen the title and thumbnail, but today's episode is really, really special to me. Uh, and in order for me to illustrate how special it is, I'll have to tell you a bit of a story. So when uh, I was, what, four, four or five years old, uh, I used to go to daycare. So it would have been three or four. So I'd go to daycare. And we'd watch all sorts of TV shows because we watch a lot of TV when I was in daycare. And uh, my favorite, besides Batman, the animated series, was this one show with a super, super catchy theme song called Darkwing Duck. And so we would go to the store and stuff, right? And I begged my mother to get me this VHS. The VHS uh, was a two-part episode that they had combined into a movie and called it Just Us Justice Ducks. And so my mother bought me that Darkwing Duck VHS and I watched it so many times and now some 30 years later we're getting a justice ducks comic book from dynamite entertainment and here to talk to me about it is series writer roger langridge how you doing today roger i'm doing well how are you i'm doing really well i'm excited as you can tell <laughs> great <laughs> i even had to wear my dark wing shirt for the occasion <laughs> <laughs> so um so I mean, obviously we're here because Dynamite's brought out a new Darkwing series. We had a 10 issue uh, Darkwing series that just wrapped up and really dovetails nicely into a new Justice Ducks series. And so we're going to talk about, you know, how that came about, how you got the call. Uh, but first, for anyone who may not be as familiar with you or your work, do you mind introducing yourself and kind of your journey into comics for the audience? Sure. Um I'm uh, from New Zealand originally. I grew up in New Zealand um, and I decided when I was very young that I wanted to be a cartoonist when I grew up. Mm. But New Zealand doesn't have a comic industry. So um, the plan from quite an early age was to uh, go to a country that did have a comic industry and try and break in there. So that's why when I was in my early 20s, I moved to London and mm. I started doing work for uh, things like the Judge Dredd magazine and um, uh, Deadline magazine, and and there were quite a lot of outlets at that time that were that were going. And I did work for Fantagraphics as well at that time. Mm. Um, I uh, we th my brother and I used to do mini comics together, and uh, we submitted some of those mini comics to Fantagraphics while I was still living in New Zealand. And they said Would they'd like to do a one shot with us, and that turned into a, an ongoing relationship with them. So. Um, so yeah, so I was I was sort of working on both sides of the Atlantic for a long time, um, uh, and uh, yeah, and um, I've always worked on my own stuff as well as sort of licensed things. More on my own stuff, to be honest. Um, so I, I self-published a comic in the early two thousands called Fred the Clown, mm -hmm. um, which led to work for Nickelodeon magazine, which in turn led to work for Disney Adventures magazine, wow. and that. Led to the Muppet Show comic book, and that's probably what I'm best known for. That's mm. um, that and Thor the Mighty Avenger, which has a connection to Justice Ducks because I have the same editor, Nate Cosby. Wow. Wow. Just, I mean, that's just, just another uh, reminder to always put your best foot forward, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, now you are a comic artist, of course, because your, your goal was to be a cartoonist, but you, you're a writer as well. What got you into writing comics? Uh, well, I used to do um, comics with my brother. Like I said, we used to do mini comics together. And um, when I moved to London, uh, it was a lot more difficult in those pre-internet days um, because we're talking early 90s there mm. um, for us to correspond and, and keep that relationship going. Um, we, we tried for a while, but it just became more and more difficult. And I ended up just writing things so that I would have something to draw. Mm. Um, and that kind of led to... Um, me getting an appetite for it, I suppose. Uh, the, the, when I started self-publishing, I was writing my own stuff then. Um, and uh, that, in turn, led to people seeing the work that I'd written and asking me to write things. Um, so I didn't intend to set out to be, I didn't set out, set out to become a, a comic book writer. It's mm -hmm. something that's just sort of evolved from, from necessity, really. Right. Okay. So... Your goal ultimately was to become a cartoonist, but what were the who were the cartoonists that you were inspired by? Well, the the really big one, and it's relevant to Justice Ducks, is mm. Carl Marx, the creator of Uncle's. Um, 
before I could read, I was, I was, you know, quote unquote, reading his comics. Right. Um, uh, he was a huge formative influence on just the way I write, the way I think about comics, really his sense of pacing, his sense of, um, language, uh, and character. It's all, it's all there. You know, if you, if you look at my work, it, Karl Marx isn't very far away. Mm. Uh, so he was huge. Um, I really love the old newspaper strips, things like, uh, Popeye and, mm. uh, a uh, crazy cat. Uh, so I've got, uh, that's a big part of what's influenced me as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I like, uh, as far as superhero things go, I, I tend to be more attracted to this kind of goofier stuff, mm. the sixties DC stuff, or, you know, some of the early Marvel stuff. Um, I really love the Marvel monster books before the superheroes came along. Uh, that was a thing for me. Um, so, you know, that's all, that's all part of the mix as well. Nice. So I want to pause for a second at Karl Barks, right? I think, you know, I'm born in 91. So Karl Barks is a bit before my time. <laughs> for those of us in the audience who may not have witnessed it, right? Because Karl Barks, his Uncle Scrooge and Donald Duck comics are like the most widely circulated comics in history. What was it about those books that made them so special? Well, he's got um, just a really great sense of story um uh people talk about his uncle scrooge comics which are sort of like these epic adventures and that's sort of like the equip the, the, the sort of the english language equivalent of things like tintin for example mm. um these sort of um beautifully crafted really tightly plotted very very funny perfect complete stories mm. um but his short stories are brilliant as well um the donald duck stories that he did in walt disney's comics and stories are, are sort of I mean, I, I really like comedy um, and the craft of writing a really good sitcom is, I think, something that's quite underrated because it's really, really diff difficult to do well. And he just did that continuously for 30 years. These 10 page stories were like these perfect little sitcoms, beautifully plotted with, you know, things set up early on that paid off later on it was, and very funny and just, you know, just uh, ticked along like a, like a metronome. That's this perfect rhythm, perfect comic rhythm to them. Right. Um, so just studying those you could learn so much from, from that, or I could. So what would you say? I mean, obviously you're a comic writer and I guess writing for television is a bit different, but what is it that's so difficult to nail about the sitcom and sort of episodic storytelling? Uh, well, in the case of sitcom, I think it's, it's quite difficult because, and it, this is also appropriate to, to comics as well, for, mm. to, to a lot of it, things can't, change um because the status quo has to sort of be reset at the end of every story mm. um but it's also you have to have the illusion of change and the illusion of progress and, and the illusion of people going on some sort of journey even if they end up where they started right so that's quite difficult to do and still be a satisfying thing to to um experience mm. to read or to watch um also it's you know making things funny is is challenging um and making them continually funny and consistently funny, even more so. Um, uh, and that, you know, there's a lot of moving parts to that. The characters have to be right. The, the, the setting has to give an opportunity for things to happen that, that they can bounce off that will sort of make that work. Um, yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot going on. It's, it's deceptively complex, I think. Right, right. So, and I mean, I love, I've, I've been diving into Hotel Fred, um, just oh, in preparation for our conversation. And it's just, it's this, for those who aren't familiar, uh, it's a self-published strip that you do and you post it daily on Instagram or on your blog. And each episode, if you will, or each issue is just four panels. It's a four panel story arranged into like a square grid. And it's just kind of like everyday situations that are just funny. Uh, the, the, the cartoon style is fun. Uh, but just to be able to get like a really short laugh for the day is just is really awesome. What inspired you to to do that, and how do you keep it going? Um, well, uh, it started because I was having a dry patch and I wasn't getting enough work, and I wanted to earn some money. So I started a Patreon, mm. um, hoping that I could you know have even if it wasn't much money, a little bit of regular money coming in that I could count on every month, you know? Um, and the idea was to have something 
every day that was uh, unique for the for the Patreons uh, mm. for the Patreon. Um, so I, I ended up doing a daily strip uh, mainly because it, I thought um, drawing on my own life would be uh, a replenishing source of material. Mm. I wouldn't have to you know, plot out a big long story in advance or anything like that. It would be relatively easy to do. So I set up um, uh, this grid that, so that I would, wouldn't would have to make that decision about how to lay it out or anything. Just, mm. you know, slap the, the drawings down every day and uh, and put it out there every day. And uh, then, then work started coming in. So I had to find a way to keep doing that as well as do my professional jobs. Right. And I ended up just getting up really early in the morning getting up at like five o'clock in the morning and doing that before I started work for the day. And I was, I've been doing that for about four years now. Wow. Um, I'm actually taking a break for a month or so now, cause I've got some writing that I need to do, uh, but I'm going to be picking it up at the beginning of next month. So, yeah. Awesome. Um, so besides the challenge of just getting up every day, um, <laughs> you, you talk about just the inspiration sort of coming from everyday life. How easy is it for you to sort of find the humor in everyday life? And, and do you find that, sort of looking for it for the strip, does it sort of help you just in regards to kind of dealing with everyday life? I think probably, yes. Um, I mean, my relationship with my family tends to to involve a lot of jokes anyway. It's mm. it's just, a, you know, how we like to communicate. And, you know, my kids are very sharp. Um, and, you know, they've got keen senses of humour, both of them, so that... Mm. So, you know, it comes quite naturally. It's, um, and sometimes, you know, I exaggerate things for comic effect, but I don't have to sometimes. It's, right. it's already, you know, just, just a funny situation that I want to get down on paper. Um, yeah. Very cool. And so you, um, like you said, you're, you're probably best known for the Muppet show. I guess it might be like the, the highest profile or the thing you did. It's consistently yeah, think- the longest, right? So, um, how did, one, how did that come about? And I guess, what was your approach to it? Um, well, first of all, how it came about, um, I was doing some freelance work for Disney Adventures magazine, um, in sort of the 2010s, I guess, or early, no, 2000s, late 2000s, Mm. uh, uh, illustration work mainly. And, um, somebody there, uh, wanted to they had this strip running of mickey mouse that was drawn in a kind of off-model style sort of an underground comics kind of sketchy style mm. by glenn boy i think it was and they wanted to do something else with some other disney properties um and one of the editors there was familiar with my friend the clown comics um which is set in a kind of vaudeville world mm. so they thought i'd be a good fit for a muppet show thing done in that kind of done with that kind of approach you know this kind of off model um gag strip approach um so i did some pages for disney adventures and one page was published and then the magazine was cancelled so uh, (laughs) so i guess these pages were circulating um with disney or whatever because i what happened after that a couple of years went by and then boom studios picked up the rights to do the muppets and i guess they'd seen those pages because then they approached me um to ask me if i would be interested in doing that as a regular thing uh, and I said yes, and uh, we're off. We're off to the races. Awesome. So, uh, for those who haven't read the Muppet Show, is there is there a sort of ongoing premise, uh, is or is there like an ongoing plot thread, or is it just kind of really episodic? Uh, well, uh, my approach to that was um, to have like the Muppet Show on television mm-hmm. um, with the with the, the main difference being we couldn't use guest stars because that would involve sort of layers and layers of approval. Um, so, uh, but I tried to do it like an episode of the Muppet Show. So um, knowing that each set of four issues would be collected into a book, I tried to have some sort of unifying theme for those four issues, but I would try to have each issue relatively self-contained, even if there was a sort of a plot thread bubbling under. And within those issues, I would do sketches mm. like the Muppet Show. So I could, it, it sort of gave me the opportunity to do anything I wanted, really. Mm. If I had an idea to do something with the comic page that, you know, there was one where I had a character running throughout, uh, through a building um, and the, the comic page was the building and, you know, time was represented by the character moving through 
this sort of cross section of the building mm -hmm. and you can do that on a comics page and it seemed right. to me that that was um the best way to approach the the muppet show comic was to do things that you couldn't see on screen to do mm -hmm. things that were kind of um that went along with the muppet sense of humor but which were unique to the comics medium and to try and sort of push that side of it as much as i could uh because otherwise why aren't you just watching television <laughs> that's true that's true um and the art in the muppet show comic is just i love it it's it's i was I going through it earlier today um how do you balance the ideas you have in your head versus what you can commit to a page right do you, is are there is there a time where as a writer you're just your imagination's running wild but then it's like you know what whether it's a deadline or some physical limitation or skill limitation you're like I, let's let's kind of abandon that or, or reshape that how does that work for you as writer and artist um well i think every every person who writes and draws their own stuff um has kind of a, a jekyll hyde relationship with themselves <laughs> uh, because you're always um cursing the writer as the artist you're cursing the writer for writing something that's going to be quite difficult to draw mm -hmm. um but you know as uh, the art of cartooning is to to simplify things and to streamline things uh and to clarify things mm -hmm. so um you uh distill it to its essence really as that's the art of cartooning that's what it's all about mm -hmm. uh, so if you draw if you give yourself something as a writer that's really complicated to draw you find ways of making it work um, sometimes that does mean drawing, you know, hundreds of little faces. Um, but if you can get away with not doing that, great. If you can think of an elegant way not to do that, that's that's the art of the 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 the, the craft of cartooning, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And it's the juggling. All right. And I guess it, it makes sense so much that your your original inspiration were were like newspaper strips or like these. You're 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 often inspired by these sort of single creator stories. Or, yeah. or mediums um i think that's cool to be able to have a whole idea and and execute it right from from script to page to letters like that's that's admirable or it's it's enviable i should say because i can't do anything like that <laughs> but hey i can interview people so that works yeah yeah um, it's, it's a valuable service right <laughs> so um so you, you you're probably best known for the muppet show and over the years, you've done a lot of sort of all ages projects, but you've done, you know, more quote unquote mature projects as well. Um, I particularly enjoy seeing something like The Muppet Show, like Justice Ducks on shelves, because what got me into comics was actually just shopping around for art for my daughter. Um, we went to like a big free comic book day event and they had, you know, artists there face painters, cosplayers, and all this stuff. And so it's an experience that, you know, I was sharing with my then nine-year-old. Now she's, gosh, I'm old. But <laughs> but but it's it's always a it's a treat because for as much as I guess the greater society sort of looks at comics as a kid's medium, most of the books on shelves are not really kid friendly, right? Um and which is ironic. But yeah. What what is it about the medium, or how is it that you are able to, I guess, balance that out? Right, you you make books and and things that are safe for sort of anyone to read, or maybe just universally loved, but you can kind of tap into a mature bag when you need to. What do you think the key is to doing that? Well, I don't know. I mean, I've worked on things like um, the Goon or the Rocketeer, um, mm. um, but. Uh, and I guess, you know, something like The Goon is probably the nearest I've got to an actual mature co comic because it's, mm. uh, it's a bit of swearing and whatnot, some sort of sexual references. Right. But even that is pretty, you know, pretty squeaky clean, I guess. Mm. I mean, it's I don't do a lot of horror or um, uh, gore or, or, you know, um, that's that's not something I'm interested in as a, as a reader. So mm. I tend not to write that stuff, you know. Um, but, I mean as far as writing for a general audience goes it's it's kind of i think short-sighted to not do that because mm. you know you're limiting your audience and comics aren't so rudely healthy that you can afford to do that i think yeah. um you do need to have i mean as uh, quite apart from having entry-level comics for new readers uh who might not be old enough for the you know for the for some of the more mature titles mm. um just cutting off your, your main titles from younger readers seems short-sighted. I mean, they've got money too, and they're happy to spend it. 
Right. No, I, I totally mm-hmm. agree. Yeah. As a parent, it, it shocks me how much I can't give yeah. to my <laughs> kids. Um, especially in a store where everything's all bright and colorful, right? Um Yeah. <laughs> so. I, th- I think there are ways of writing um things that adults will appreciate. Yeah. Uh, and still make them accessible to kids. And, you know, maybe they, they're not going to get all of it. Mm. Um, some of it will go over their heads, but it, if you if you allude to things rather than spelling them out, that's actually more challenging for an adult reader as well. Right. So, you know, everybody wins. Nice. And so, and for, for years, you've been kind of doing that with the sort of major licensed properties. And so we've, we've got the Muppet Show, and now you're moving into to Justice Ducks. So... You mentioned that, you know, Nate was your editor on the Thor series before. Yeah. And so uh, I imagine, you know, it was pretty simple for him to say, you know what, let's put Roger on this. But to your knowledge, how did that come about? Well, we've been talking about doing a couple of other things together. Um, one one with Nate as a writer and me drawing and another one that I would be writing and drawing and he would be editing. And for whatever reason, both of those projects have been taking a long time to to get going. Mm-hmm. Um with approvals and whatnot. So um, I was uh, having, having put quite a few months into, into working on these, these other things. Um, I needed to get some paying work. So I mentioned this to Nate and he had this justice ducks project mm. ready to go. Basically it had already been approved. Um, and he knew that I liked Carl Barks and he knew that I liked old sixties marbles and, you know, silver age comics. And mm. he thought I'd be a really good fit for that. So I said, yes. And, um, off we went. Uh, and, you know, I had to write, uh, you know, a, an outline and get that approved. And then I had to write another outline and get that approved. Um, being Disney, th- these things take a while, but uh, we got right. there in the end. And, um, off we went. Nice. So uh, Justice Ducks is going to be a five issue miniseries. Yeah. Um, and you're writing, uh, but Carlo Sid Loro is on art. Carlo, uh, who was the series artist for Darkwing Duck. Uh, so for the last year or so for you guys who are reading Darkwing um, or excited for this, know that the art is in great hands. Uh, it's yeah, it's it, really good. It, it looks it's so fun. It it looks just like the show, but better because technology is better. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's awesome. Um, so I know we can't spoil anything ahead of the issue coming out next week, but is there a general or what can you tell us about the story for Justice Ducks? Um, okay, well, there's uh, each issue is more or less self-contained, but there's a, an ongoing subplot okay. that gets involved in the in the final issue. So um, they all involve aliens, <laughs> and there's a reason they all involve aliens, and that's kind of how we resolve that. What what gets resolved at the end? But yeah, um, yeah it's it's an excuse for me to do things like um, you know old Marvel monsters like Fin Fang Foom, that kind of thing. Right. Um, we've got some sort of uh, there's a, there's like a some something that's slightly reminiscent of Doctor Who that you might recognise. Mm. There's um, uh, yeah various sort of tropes of aliens from popular fiction pop up throughout the series, um, right. and you know the characters are all there, all present and correct. Um, the um, uh, supporting cast is there. We've got Goslin and uh, uh, Launchpad, and um, I think um, Honka pops up in one issue. Um, so, you know, the, everybody from the show that you recognize will be there. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, I, uh, we've got Darkwing moaning about it all because, you know, he, he's not a joiner. He's, he's right. a so- solo artist. Um, right. and he, he likes to do things his own way. So, you know, being the sort of, he's sort of the, the reluctant member of the team, I guess. And he's sort of like the grit in the oyster. Right. No, for sure. Uh, and that's, that was one of the funny thing, fun things about, uh, this Darkwing uh, comic that just ended, right, is watching him sort of um, fight all the way having a team. Like, he does not want to have a team until he absolutely needs one, right? And that's even central to the Just Us, Justice Ducks episode, right? Like, Darkwing wants to be the cool guy with the gas gun. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted an <laughs> excuse to put this on camera. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> but uh he doesn't work well with others but he has to work well with others um I'll, I'll ask this right how how much research goes into writing a title like this like do you have to spend hours watching the tv show did you already have like familiarity with it i wasn't that familiar with it at all i, I sort of knew the character vaguely but um 
I did have to do quite a bit of research. So, you know, I watched old episodes and read some of the, the old comics. Mm. Um, and uh, there, there's a, a Darkwing wiki that I consulted quite heavily um, <laughs> just to, to make sure I got the facts straight. Right. Um, and of course, you know, there were people from Disney um, checking all my scripts. So if I strayed too far from what the characters were supposed to be, they sort of put me back on track. So if, you know, if you're invested in the characters, you should be happy. Awesome. Awesome. Now, I talked about this with uh, Sweeney Boo a couple of weeks ago. We were talking about Cruella de Vil and just uh, surprising things that she wasn't able to do with Cruella in the comics. Um, was there anything surprising to you that you weren't able to include in Justice Ducks? Um, yes, uh, there were a few things. I've got um, a very, what seems to be arbitrary rule about referring to monkeys. Um, apparently, you can't do that. Uh, th th there, there was things about using uh the word crazy even if it wasn't relating to somebody's mental health if, if it was just like a crazy looking uh drawing or you know whatever yeah. you want you know something like that you weren't allowed to use the word things like that um yeah. uh so yeah i mean that's fine you know you you find other words you find other ways of doing these things it's 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 not a not an insurmountable problem or anything but it's just you know you scratch your head and think okay what was that about what was that about <laughs> right yeah I guess it's easy to say mad instead of crazy, right? You're across the waters. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, that's that's interesting, right? I, we talked about uh, Cruella. Cruella de Vil's not allowed to smoke anymore. Um, uh -huh. And that's been a thing for a while, basically since yeah. right after that first live action movie. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. Um, now, you work with licensed properties a lot. Do you sort of enjoy working in those parameters or enjoy the challenge that comes with uh having to sort of hold up a banner so to speak uh, it depends on the property i guess if if mm. it's something that's sort of in sync with my own sensibilities mm. that's obviously more fun than something that um i feel isn't but i've been pretty lucky most of them have been mm. um uh yeah i mean the the one that i i guess was was most um uh, sort of you know one that I ticked off my wish list was Popeye. That mm. was huge um, because I was a fan of Popeye since I was a kid, um, especially the EC Seagull strips from the from the thirties. Mm. Um, so uh, to be able to write Popeye was was terrific, uh, and the Muppets too. You know that that sense of humour, yeah, probably quite a big influence on uh, my comics later on. Nice. Yeah. No, it's funny. I I watched a lot of Popeye as a kid. Right. I'm, I came up in the nineties. We had Cartoon Network, and I didn't realize at the time that most of what they were showing on Cartoon Network were reruns of like mm -hmm. far older shows. So I watched a lot of Popeye, The Flintstones, um, even like stuff like Thundercats. Like I was watching, um, and it's funny because a lot of that stuff is with Dynamite now, and I'm excited to to sort of get to revisit those things as an adult. Um, what is it about Popeye? that you adored well for one thing he, he looks like um there is there is nothing about him that could have been made up by a committee you know <laughs> he's so totally unique and individual he's not designed even slightly to appeal to readers in fact he's designed to actively repel readers and right. they still love him you know he's mm -hmm. his rough edges are what make him interesting i think um and he's uh for for such an abrasive character weirdly inclusive he's really you know uh, i suppose equally distant from everyone <laughs> right so uh yeah he's 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 got this sort of abrasive surface but a really a really good heart um there's something really appealing about that for sure that no i i don't know what it was about popeye that just just kind of enchanted me as a kid now that i'm thinking about it maybe maybe i just liked just you know how like after he ate the spinach like he just beat up anyone like punching bulls <laughs> like it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't matter and like he would just do like the most outrageous feats um and then you got the other guy that likes to eat hamburgers and like, yeah, yeah how many ways can bluto <laughs> take olive oil captive like but it was always fun and it's just like i don't know when i think of cartoon i think of popeye like it's just like the most cartoonish thing like you can't it's 
there's things that happen in Popeye that you just couldn't do in live action or like wouldn't look good with like CGI. It's just good old fashioned cartoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Moving lines. Right. Well, or not moving in the case of, of comic strips. True. True. So, um, okay. So we've talked a lot about just the the fun and joy in cartooning. Um, what are some of the things that you're you're looking at and enjoying right now? What am I looking at and enjoying? Um, I've been working through a pile of Christmas books. Um, I've got some graphic novels by Jason, um, uh, published by Fanta Graphics. Um, mm. Upside Dawn is the one I just read. Um, I've got the new Daniel Klaus book, uh, Monica, which I'm looking forward to. That's in the pile. Um, and outside of comics, I've been reading some books. There's uh, a series by uh, C.K. McDonnell um, called The Stranger Times, which I've been enjoying. That's sort of humorous, supernatural stuff. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. What else? Um, there's a book came out recently by a cartoonist I really like, a British cartoonist called Mark Stafford, um, which is a collection of stuff he's done over the, the last 20, 30 years called Sell Man Other Small is Bored, mm. um, which is really great, sort of horror but funny as well. Um, mm. He's he's a very, very talented cartoonist. Very well, you know, He can draw really well, but he puts it in the service of this very funny, dark stuff. Um, yeah, off the top of my head, there's a few things. Nice. And so you've been working in cartoons for a long time. Are there any sort of dream characters or dream comics you'd love to do, but haven't gotten an opportunity to do them yet? Uh, there's an old strip, Barney Google, that I really love. Mm -hmm. And I got a chance to do one Barney Google story in an issue of Popeye. Mm -hmm. um, and I would love to do more with that character. Uh, nobody cares. You know, it'll never happen. <laughs> He's a character that nobody's heard of. So you know, it's just me who wants that. But right. you know, that, would be, that would be one for the bucket list. Um, of things that people have heard of, I don't know. Um, I've, I've done most of the stuff I really love. I, I'd love to do a, you know, Uncle Scrooge. I'd love to do an Uncle Scrooge story. Yeah. Um, because that was such a formative influence on me. Yeah. Okay. Now, do you know where Uncle Scrooge is right now? I don't know if that's still with Fanagraphics or if Dynamite could do an Uncle Scrooge book. I don't know who's doing the new stuff. I, I mean, obviously, there's um, loads of European publishers who've been doing them for years. Mm. That's where Bob Rosa did most of his stuff. Um, so I guess that's an option as well. Uh, I don't know who's doing new stuff in the English speaking market. I don't know if anybody is. Mm. So that's, you know, it's kind of a shame, really. It is. That is to think about. Huh. I don't know. Let's start a, let's start a petition. Yeah. <laughs> Roger for Uncle Scrooge. Um, okay. So Justice Ducks is out uh, January 24th, which is great because my birthday is the 22nd. So Hooray! I, get to, I get to buy two copies <laughs> as a gift to myself. <laughs> my favorite cover is uh, for issue one is that JLI homage oh, right. that you did. I really love that cover. Um, Thank you. Oh, so even how is it wrapping up a, like putting a cover on a book that you also wrote and drew like what are you thinking about when it comes to okay how do i present this to the guy that's just walking into the shop how do i get them to grab it um it's not an exact science my my method is generally to do a whole lot of different sort of little thumbnail drawings mm -hmm. and then send the best ones to whoever's the editor in this case that was nate and uh he'll say go for that one and sometimes I'll draw it and then Disney will say, no, we don't like that. So mm. <laughs> um, I have to go back and do another one. But uh, uh, yeah, so th there's a lot of variables. Um, I ideally, you want something that's just a, a catchy idea and visually striking um, and something that doesn't look too much like the previous one either because you want them to stand out from one another as well as from everything else in the stands. Right. Um, so uh, yeah, that's sort of my approach just to try and, 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 you know, to keep it simple and striking, keep the composition simple so that it doesn't, you know, you don't get lost. It doesn't get lost. Right. The important details don't get confused. For sure. Okay. So, um, yeah, so Justice Ducks is out January 24th. I'm excited about it, as you guys can tell. Um, and you can grab that at dynamite.com slash Disney. Or, of course, you can pre-order at your LCS. It'll be a five-issue series. So go ahead, grab issue one, and let your shop owner know, hey, I want the whole enchilada. <laughs> but, um, 
outside of Justice Ducks, what other projects are you working on right now? Right. Well, I've got um, a graphic novel coming out later this year from First Second Books uh, about the Prohibition era. Um, it's part of their history comics line. Uh, that's written by Jason Viola and drawn by me. Um, that's coming out in October. Um, uh, I'm working on some some personal stuff. I've got a, a self-published comic I did for a while called Zoot that I want to get back to. Nice. Um, and there was a serial running in that about William McGonagall, um, who, if you haven't heard of him, was a real character from the 19th century um, who is widely regarded as the worst poet who ever lived. And I've been doing a story about an incident in his life when he visited London and tried to make his fortune mm-hmm. and sort of what happened there. Um, so I'm, I've done a couple of chapters of that and then it was on hiatus for a couple of years and I'm trying to get back into that. I'm working on that at the moment. Um, and I've got a, a, these projects with Nate Cosby that I was talking about. Hopefully one of those will be starting up soon. Um, okay. Just waiting for somebody to sign off on it. Awesome. And so um, before, I, before we sign off, I'm going to ask, because I guess you've always had the goal of being a cartoonist and now you're a cartoonist, which that's an amazing feat within itself. Um, but when it's all said and done, right, if somebody's going to look back at the the life and work of Roger Landridge, what do you want that life's work? Like, what do you want the statement to be about it? Uh, in a perfect world, I'd be best remembered for the stuff I came up with myself. Mm-hmm. Um I don't think that's going to happen. I think probably uh, my tombstone will read "Wrote the Muppets and Died," um, but uh, <laughs> you know uh, that's not bad either. Um, mm. If people enjoy it and it means something to them, that's that's worth that's worthwhile. Okay. And so, is there is there say like a central theme or like a a thesis that you might have for your work that you that you try to represent every time you step up to a project? Uh not really. I mean, I try to make it something I would want to read, which mm. I suppose is what everybody tries to do. But right. um, yeah, uh, I'm really conscious of being part of a, a lineage, you know, of of the kind of cartooning I do. Mm-hmm. Not being in fashion particularly, but um, in uh, a tradition that goes back to the beginnings, you know, to, to old newspaper strips and that sort of thing. Mm. Um, uh, and I hope I'm carrying the torch for that kind of cartooning um, because I, I, I regard that as kind of where it all came from. You know, the fundamental building blocks of my craft came from there and I hope to continue that tradition. Nice. Nice. No, that you, you strike me as someone who is very much sort of well, well studied. Um, you know, and dedicated to a craft, even, you know, even just in what you're reading and, and what you recommend, right? It's, it's it's off the beaten path isn't the word per, per se, but it's really just like, it's it's dedication is, is what comes through. Uh, so that's exciting. Um, and so it makes me want to check out more of your work um, because, you know, like I said, I was, I was mostly familiar with the Muppets. I've only been reading comics for like five years. So now I get to, through the power of the internet, go and find everything. And so I'm excited to to now know of your work um, and to be able to share it with others as I come across. Fantastic. Awesome. So, well, Justice Ducks is out once again, January 24th, next Wednesday. Go to your local comic shop and pre-order it. You can order it online at dynamite.com slash Disney. I just want to say thank you to Nick and Amy for helping to set this conversation up. And of course, thank you to you, Roger, for making the time to speak with us. Thanks, Brandon. It's been nice. No problem at all. All right. Well, you guys have a good one. I don't know what you guys are doing, but make sure you stay safe, stay awesome, and uh, read something dope today.